Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to track two. My name is Michael Shear, the Prez 98. And I have to tell you that when I, the schedule came out and I found out that my talk was five o'clock on Sunday, I was a little worried. And I'm not worried at all. Thank you so much for pr more or less packing the room here. And uh, I hope that uh, your commitment of the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes with me will be worth it. So thank you. I'm going to talk today um, about a tool, a search engine called Shodan, and some applications that it has for penetration testing. This is what we're going to talk today. I'm going to talk about um, what is Shodan. It's a search engine, but it's a little bit different than other search engines. Search engines. So I want to explain how it's different. Talk about some basic operations. A little bit about the applications of the search engine to penetration testing, and then. I've worked through a number of case studies and I want to present them to you. That's kind of the bulk of the presentation and how that really applies to what you can do as a penetration tester. So when I use penetration testing in the title, uh, I could use all these things in the title. And I'm not suggesting that all these things mean the same thing because they're all different. However, if you do any of these things, then what I'm going to talk to you today applies to you. So I could say, I could put all of these things in the title, but then the title would be just unwieldy. So when I say penetration testing, this is what I mean, all of this stuff. How many of you do one of these things? Probably most of you. Okay, good. So what is Shodan? Shodan is a search engine. It's a computer search engine. It's designed by a web developer named John Matherly, who's with us here today, actually, and we'll talk to him a little bit later. Um, but it does, it's, it doesn't, it's not a search engine. It's not the same as a search engine like Google or Bing or Yahoo. Those search engines crawl um, web pages for data and then index that data and make it searchable for you. Shodan, on the other hand, um, interrogates ports, so interrogates port 80 of a particular server, and it grabs the banner. So we're not talking about the, the data on the web page. We're actually talking about the banner. So um, whatever HTTP status code you get, um, and then the banner. So IAS 5.0 or 6.0, whatever software is running, version number, et cetera. And then indexes the banners rather than the web content for searching. So we have a search engine of banners and not of uh, content. So instead of looking for specific content on a page, we're looking for specific information about the page. So is it a desktop, is it a server, a router, a switch, or a printer, or some other sort of device? Um, we can find that out by looking at the content in the banner. Typically these are on port 80, but they could be banners on port 21 or 22 or 23 or some others that we'll talk about. Optimizing search results for Shodan requires us, or at least is helpful for us to have some knowledge of what a banner looks like. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Basic operations of Shodan. This is just a nice little screenshot of Shodan. The, the, uh, the URL, uh, by the way, is www.shodanhq.com. And you'll come to this uh, nice uh, page here, and it's got a search box on the top, just like every other search engine. And again, like I talked about, it's going to be a little bit different for in terms of what you're searching for. There are also um, two Firefox add-ons that I'll just briefly mention. One is a search provider add-on, which adds, if you're using Firefox, adds uh, Shodan to the little box in the top right corner of the browser. And then there's a Shodan helper add-on that is a, a sidebar. Um, uh, f extension for you. I'm not going to talk about these other than to just mention them that they're available. So basic operations. Wh what's the difference between searching uh, Google or searching, um, ya uh, or searching Yahoo or searching Shodan? Well, the syntax is kind of the same. It, we, we can use Boolean operations, plus, minus, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we can use quotation marks to narrow down a search. Um, and you just enter them into the box. So the syntax, of course, of, of, of what you put in to Shodan is the same as any other search engine. However, what you, the actual content of your search term is going to be a little bit different. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about searching later. Login. Uh, there's a couple options. Uh, you can use Shodan without logging in at all. 
although there is some limitations to the results that you can get and some of the filters that you can use. Um, you can also create a Shodan account, which is kind of a, uh, an account specifically for that page. Or if you have any other one of these accounts, Google, Twitter, Yahoo, uh, AOL, Facebook, OpenID, if you have those accounts, you can actually log in with those accounts as well. And again, like I said, login is not required to use Shodan, but there's a couple filters, for example, a country and a net filter, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and, and those the, will not work for you if you don't log in. There's also an export feature that allows you to export results into an XML uh, format, and that will not work unless you log in. So just login page, you can just create a Shodan account or you can just log in one of those other accounts. Most people have something of one of those accounts if that's what you want to do. So let me talk a little bit about the filters. Filters are ways that you can take the amount of, the, the amount of data that you get with, from Shodan and kind of narrow it down uh, to a manageable level. As we look at later, if you type in the word Cisco into Shodan, there's 350,000 or something like that devices in Shodan that have Cisco in their banner. Well, that's not really useful for us if we're looking for a specific device. So the filters will help narrow us down. The first is an after or, uh, so in the case of the slide here, the, the, the filter is actually the word in bold. So uh, followed by a colon and then followed by whatever the syntax is. So for example, if we put after colon and then a date in the format of day, month, year, uh, we can limit our results to uh, um, information that's been added to the search engine since that date. So we can look for frequency of data or, or the look for data, we can exclude older data if we want. Or before, we can do that as well. Uh, the country filter filters by two letter country code. So if you know the two letter country code, um, whatever the IP address uh, country that's registered to, so for example, uh, obviously country colon US will limit it to um, US uh, registered IP addresses. Host name uh, filters by text in the host name or domain. So if, we're, if we want to limit our results to the .edu domain or if we want to limit our results to google.com or we want to, you know, whatever, whatever words you want to use in a domain or a host name, you can limit your results to that. A net filter, uh, specific IP range or subnet. Obviously, if you're looking for a specific target, uh, say your company owns a you know a class B or something like that, and you just want to filter on that, obviously you can do that. The OS filter will will search by specific specific operating system, so Linux, Windows, whatever you want to put in there. Uh, port will narrow by specific services. I'll talk a little bit about the services that are in Shodan now. And then there's also a number of SSL filters um, that are available with an SSL add-on to Shodan. This, uh, this slide just kind of shows you where you can enter the data. All the data you can enter uh, directly into the search box if you want, the filters. Um, the other ways that you can uh, filter is if you look at the, uh, there's a drop down map. And as you can see on the map, the color of the country is kind of color coded based on how many um, IP addresses in that country have been searched. So you can see obviously the US is, has the most on here as well as China, Japan, and Germany, et cetera. Um, and then you can filter by port by clicking on the box there. But you, it's easy enough just to put it in the, um, in the search box if you want. On the country filter, if you mouse over a country, it will tell you, the country will turn yellow and it will tell you how many hosts have been scanned in that country. So for example here on, in the United States, um, some, you know, ridiculously large number. So a couple, exa a couple search examples using the filters. Um, I know you probably can't see it from here but I'll read it to you. The search here is Apache country colon ch. Ch being the country code for Switzerland. So what this will do is it will find all the results in Shodan that are registered to a Swiss IP address that have the word Apache in the banner. Um, and the results that you'll see here, um, over here on the left you'll have a IP address with a uh, hyperlink to the, to the actual result. Uh, below that you'll have an operating system if it has been identified. Below that, there's a date that that result was added to the search engine. And then uh, there's a nice little country flag here as well. This here is the actual banner that you get back from that result. And any search terms that you enter will be highlighted in red. So you can see here that um, 
This was a, a Apache 2.2.13 running on free BSD, etc. So this is where I talk about knowing what, what, what the banner uh, shows you is, is helpful for searching for certain sorts of results. Um, here the search term is Apache 2.2.3. So this will find any servers that have 2.2.3, Apache 2.2.3 in the banner. Here we didn't use a country code and shown in is helpful for us and actually will display the top four countries um, by results. So United States, Germany, France, Canada. If we're logged in so that we can use the country filter, we can just click on that and that will filter that down for, further for us. Basic operations, a hostname filter. Okay, so we want to filter by hostname. So the search here is Apache hostname colon dot nist dot gov. So now we can limit our searches to devices in the dot nist dot gov domain that have Apache in the filter or that have Apache in the, uh, in the web banner. Or IAS 5.0 hostname edu. So now we're looking at just IAS 5.0 or Microsoft 2000 servers that are in, um, the EDU domain. And obviously if you wanted to m m put a, a specific university or something like that, you could certainly do that as well. And then I talked about the net and, and the net filter. So if you want to filter by an IP or CIDR notation, you can certainly do that as well. It's definitely useful if you're, if you really want to limit down to one specific area that you're looking for. And then the OS filter if you want to just for looking for specific operating system. Finally, you can um, for filter by port. Current collection is, uh, is FTP on 21, SSH on 22, Telnet on 23, um, HTTP on, on 80, uh, SNMP on 161, and uh, recently added is HTTPS data on uh, 443. Uh, I should note, and I'll talk a little bit later, that this data is only available through an add-on which requires you to, which requires some credits. I did talk, uh, so the SSL filters, these are the SSL filters that are available with the SSL add-on. So you can search for all, they're, they're, I won't go through them specifically, but they're, they're self-explanatory as to what you can search for um, if you're looking for specific information in the certificate or the cipher that's being used, so the version of SSL or whatever certificate uh, information you're looking for. Search history for Shodan. Uh, if you create an account and lo um, well, just using Shodan, the, the, the search history in, in, in essence is disabled. In other words, your searches aren't being saved for you. Um, if you do create an account and uh, you can enable search history and then you can save your own searches so that if you find searches that are useful to you or searches that are finding useful data to you for you, you can kind of save them uh, in a way. Um, and again, if you just if if you go ahead and disable that once you've already enabled it, then your searches won't be indexed um, by the search engine. Um, Shonan uh, allows you to export um, data, um, and this goes into XML format. So there's a sample data uh, file there that you can download if you want to look at what the format that it comes out in. And this is, this is one of those add-on features uh, that's, that's available for Shodan. So I, and, and, and the, the, the second add-on or the second other add-ons are the HTTPS data and the extended search. So uh, typically even if you're logged into Shodan, you're going to be limited in the number of results you can see. If you do the um, extended search add-on, you can view up to 10,000 results. So one of the first questions that I, when I talked to John about this is like, well, what kind of feedback have you gotten about, you know, charging for, for add-ons or extra results and something like that? And he said, and he, and he could probably talk about this later if he wants, but um, he hasn't, I mean, it's, he's done a lot of work. So I mean, he, th he thinks his, his time is valuable and the work that he's done is valuable. So if you want extra results uh, beyond what the initial um, search engine is giving you, then, you know, it feels like it's reasonable to, to ask for, uh, you know, some, something for that. And we can talk about that later if you want. I will say that all the stuff that I've done, um, it was on the not not having you know using none of the add-ons. Shodan also has a newly uh, added section called Network Radar, 
And this is just a nice little uh, picture of the world and, and uh, it will show you recently added data to Shodan. So what it will do is it will show you a nice little um, symbol uh, over a, an area or city or, and, and then it will show you the banner. So this is kind of a just nice kind of view of, of things that have been re recently added. Let's talk about uh, applications of Shodan for penetration testing. So John originally developed this as a, as a marketing and research tool and it was not really specifically geared towards penetration testers or the hacking community. But you can see, I'm sure that most of you can see that there's certainly opportunities here to look through the data that's been collected in Shodan for opportunities for penetration testing. So that's what I want to talk about. Before I go there, I want to talk a little bit about ethics um, and yeah, ethics. And uh, just kind of go through a couple, you know, uh, hypothetical scenarios and kind of just go through some uh, questions that that may come to mind. And I will say that when I did this test, when all the all the all the um, all the things that I've done for the examples here were just done on my own. I was not authorized to do anything. So. These are kind of rhetorical questions for you. Is it acceptable under any circumstances to view the configuration of a device that requires no authentication to view? So if we quick click, click, click on one of these links and it takes us to a some sort of device and it logs us right in because there's no there's no authentication, is that okay to view that? What about viewing the configuration of the device if we use the default username and password to get into it? Or what about viewing the device if we used a unique username or password? What about changing the configuration of a device that we don't own or that we don't have authorization to you? So this is kind of a, a black to white spectrum and, and this is where I would put these questions on there. You may disagree with it but I think most of you would generally agree with the general placement. So viewing the configuration of a device that requires no authentication. I think that's pretty, pretty clear. I think you could view that. You're not changing anything. You're just looking. There was no authentication required. You just clicked on a result and went right in there. Using a default username and password, well, I think you're getting into a you know, darker shade of gray here because despite the fact that they're using a def default username and password, you're s there's still some authentication mechanism that's trying to keep you out. That's just as far as I went, by the way. I'll show you an example of that one later. Um, using a unique username and password somehow that you captured, I think that's fairly black. And then also changing configuration of the device that you don't have permission to do, I and mean, it's fairly black as well. Like I said, I went to about the middle, so I wouldn't go any further than that. But that's up to you. I think that, that using Shodan for penetration testing requires uh, some basic knowledge of banners, like I talked about. And also, it's very useful to you to know HTTP status codes. And you all know these, but I think it's important to review them because. Uh, we can use them to actually filter out results. Um, we know that banners typically uh, talk about the services that they're running and the versions that they're running. Um, I've talked to very few people who have ever spoofed banners. Some people do, but most people don't. Uh, so we're assuming here that the banners aren't, sp aren't being spoofed. Just a quick overview of, of, some, of some HTTP status codes that we will see and how they can be useful to us. 200 OK, request succeeded. This is typically our best result because this means we're going to be able to view the page without any uh, authentication at all. Uh, 301 and 302 are uh, moved or found and we'll, we'll see that those are not terribly useful to us. 401 unauthorized requires authentication and then 403 is a forbidden. In other words, we can't go there. So what is, how does that apply to us? Well, again, 200 OK is, is really what we're looking for because that's going to allow us to view a page without seeing anything else. It's not going to ask us for a password, probably at least not to view that page. Um, 301 and 302 typically for, in, in the case of Shodan, it doesn't really provide us with a lot of data. Yes, could you follow the result where it's moved to, but of, typically it's, it's kind of a just running into the dark without really knowing where you're going. Uh, so we can use the filters, uh, the, the, the Boolean logic to filter these out. 401 unauthorized is typically saying no, you, can, you don't have permission to view this page. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can't get there. Um, 
In a 401 unauthorized on a web banner, we'll typically have a www authenticate line, and that will typically indicate to us the presence of a pop-up box. So if we go to one of these, we'll get a pop-up box asking for a username and password. 403 forbidden, typically we, there's, no, there's some reason that we can't view the page. And it's also important to note that some banners advertise defaults. We'll see banners that say default the password is 1234. Doesn't mean that they're using that, but it, it, they're at least telling us what it is. So that's useful data for us. So the first of my four case studies is the Cisco devices. And this is the first Cisco banner I found and I just wanted to show it as an example. The two boxes in red, uh, sir, uh, squared in red are, the first one is a status code, so it's HTTP 401 unauthorized. And then we see a www authenticate, basic realm, level 15 or view access. I can tell you that when you see this, when you click on the result for this, you're going to get a pop up box and it's going to ask you for a username and password. And if we don't have it, obviously we can't get to that page. Here's an example of a Cisco banner that, that is a 200 OK. Notice that it has, it does not have a www authenticate box and it also has the last modified box. When we put these side by side, we find that, that we find that um, it's the two lines, www authenticate and last modified are almost 99.9% mutually exclusive. So what does that mean for us? Well, Let's look at the results here. So this is as of last night. If I search Shodan for Cisco, I get 306,000 some devices. Um, the WW Authenticate, 253,000. Last modified, 5,800. And then only 31 that have both of those lines. So what that means is if we can get a 200 uh, OK with a Cisco, chances are that device is not going to require any authentication at all. In fact, we really have about 5,900 devices as of last night, Cisco devices on the internet publicly facing that require no authentication at all to view, change configurations, do whatever you want. You've already owned them. So let's take a look at one. S many of you will recognize this is the Cisco, uh, this is a Cisco switch and this is the HTML interface. And if we wanted to um, administer this interface or administer this device uh, at a certain level, we could click on um, one of these numbers right here. And whatever number of the level we want is what it will take us to. So surely if we click on level 15, which is like administrator access, it's going to then ask us for a pop-up, right? And it's going to, that's when we're, we're going to be stopped right there. No, it doesn't. So I haven't, I don't have my CCNA. I don't know what the commands are. Well, they're all right there for you. And they're hyperlinked for you. So if you want to do anything to this device and you don't even know the, the, CCN, the Cisco commands, you can just click on them. And there's a whole page here. You can see that the scroll bar is pretty small. So I mean, you could pretty much run anything. And I ran a few commands, but I just did some show commands because I didn't want to actually, I told you I was not going to change the configuration of a device. So this is the configure commands menu. We, we were able to get in there with no authentication at all. Here's the execute command menu. We can get in there without any configuration at all. I ran show running config and I got the running config. I ran show CDP neighbors. I went, let's see what else is around it. And I got some other devices. I won't go into uh, too many specific details, but um, people will generally say, well, I know this guy, he's doing a CCNA and he set up a router, so it's probably just one of those things, right? Well, some of them might be, and some of these are infrastructure devices belonging to ISPs, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So what else is out there, Cisco devices? Well, this is a Cisco AirNet access point. This is just the home page though. If we went to one of the uh, setup pages or the security page, it probably would ask us for a username and password. Or it doesn't. So what do you want to do? Change it? Turn it off? Change the IP address? Yeah. Security page? No, nothing there either. 
they really should enable encryption or maybe we should enable it for them. <laughs> Network interfaces, security, services, you want to turn on some services, turn off some services. So, okay, let's keep going. This is a Catalyst 2960 switch. This is the dashboard view. I, you know, if we went to the configuration view, it's going to ask us for a password, right? No, it's not going to. Some people are really good about labeling their ports. They'll tell you everything you want to know. Where they go to. I actually had one example that's not on here that was a, um, it was a real estate company in New York and they owned several buildings uh, and they had a switch that administered internet access to various businesses. And each one of their ports was like to XYZ company or to this company or to. So, I mean, and, and what about turning them off or just let's go have duplex for a day and see how their internet, you know. <laughs> and again, let me, let me be clear, I didn't change anything on these devices, but you could if you wanted to. You could. I mean, you, it's right there. Setup page. Yeah, I mean, more or whatever you want. Cisco uh, Security Device Manager Express. Configuration. Change the password. Change the IP address. Change the routing. Security. It's pretty much whatever you want. I mean, there are, like I said, there are probably, I don't know, five, six thousand of these devices out there on the internet. And that's just what Shodan is indexed. Shodan is not indexed the entire internet, large portions, but not the entire internet. So that's just what's, what's already been indexed. It's kind of scary. So second case study on default passwords. And this was the easiest search I did and I just searched for the words default password because I wanted to see what banners have the word default password in them. And again, let me caveat. This doesn't mean that that device is using that default password but at least they're telling us what it is. So, and how many people change them? Some people don't change them. So chances are some of these devices will be using them. So this is a lowest hanging fruit attack but of course, you know, let's try it. So this is the absolute first one I found. It's a 401. It has a WWW authenticate, basic realm, default password 1234, print sir, web port. It's a, it's a web interface for a printer. So we're probably going to get a pop up box, right? So yes, it's not using a, it's, it doesn't mean it's using the default password, but it's a possibility. But there, so we, we know that the default password could, is one, two, three, four. What about the username? Well, there's none listed. So what are our options? Well, a null username, right? Or admin or root, probably. So what do we get? Pop up box. So what do I try first? I'm going to try a null username because they didn't list anything and I'm going to try one, two, three, four. But the chances that it's working the first time, it never works the first time. Or it does. <laughs> this device is, I mean, this is nothing big. It's, it's, this, it's the setup for a printer, but you know, what, if you, you know, what do you want to do? Oh, by the way, all these, all these menus, all the, everything here is accessible now because even though we, it's the default password, we've effectively logged in. So we've, we've authenticated. Occasionally, um, if your browser or your computer is not set up to display like foreign language stuff, sometimes you get these cr uh, codes and things. I found that if you don't know the language, and even if they do display the language, like it's Chinese or Japanese or whatever, typically the underlying HTML is still in English. So if you mouse over the links that you don't understand and look at the status bar, it will typically tell you what, you, what those things are. I mean, some of them are pretty obvious there. Well, I went after Cisco, so let's go after Huawei. I mean, they're, you know, probably what, number two, right? So instead of, I searched for Cisco before, but I want to search for um, Huawei. And this is where I use those um, exclusions of I don't want 400 codes, I don't want 300 codes. So I just did minus, I minused all of those. 
And the result is that I get all 200 OKs, which is exactly what I want. And it turns out that there's 283 or so Huawei results on the internet and almost all of them, or at least a good portion of them, are all within the same subnet. And I was like, that's kind of interesting. And um, if you look at, I know you probably can't tell, but it's 150.186 whatever and the, and, and the flag is the Venezuela flag. So I thought this was kind of interesting. And the result is it's Huawei ET523, well, well I want to figure out what that is. Well it's the Echo Life IP phone. Okay. So someone has a whole bunch of these phones public facing to the internet. So let's check out what they have. Oh. See this is a good example where we had a 200 OK. So it says yes you can view the page but it's asking for a password. And I couldn't, so I, you know, what's the default password for a Huawei ET523? I don't know, but I found that the default for most Huawei devices is, I don't know, password or something. So put it in and see what happens. And again, these things never work on the first time, or they do. I'll scroll through these just to show you the whole screen, but yeah, this is the entire configuration for the phone. A um, couple of interesting things here. One would be um, the URL for the firmware upgrades. So if you want to change that and upload some rogue firmware to them, you can certainly do that if you wanted to. Or you could do stupid things like change the ringtones and other things like that. <laughs> it turns out that this is some technology corporation and in Venezuela and if you go to their home page there's smiling Hugo Chavez all over the page. So if you want to mess with him, you know, go for it. <laughs> and but notice I didn't block out any of the IP addresses. So I mean they're right there for you. <laughs> I'm not encouraging you to break the law. I'm just showing you something. <laughs> okay. This is my favorite one and so I saved it for last. Uh, but the title was kind of boring. Infrastructure exploitation. That sounds kind of boring. So I changed the title. <laughs> Some of you may, uh, I did a talk up in the sky boxes on, on Friday and, and the talk was just about this section. So, and I think you, you, mo the, the, those people would agree that I didn't really oversell the, you know, the title for this section because I want, you'll see what happens. So I was running across a number of Cisco devices and this, I was doing a random search. I wasn't looking for anything specific. And I found one of these, again, it's another Cisco web interface. And so, well, let's just go right for level 15. Yeah. And I, I, I did uh, white out some of the things on here because this was a, at the time, this was a open problem with this, pro you know, company. Um, show IP route. And this, there's a long page of this, and I ran a show BD, uh, um, some other commands, the running config, and so I'm running through these commands. And when I get to um, show CDP neighbors, and I know I blanked out the device IDs, but the URL was very interesting, and, and the, because it said uh, it was a it was a telephone, it was an ISP, and um, so there, you can see here that there's a number of. Uh, 3750 switches and then there's a Cisco 7606 which is the core router for the ISP and they were, they were all open. Yeah. So I looked up the IP address and it turns out that this was an ISP in Florida. I'll say that. So all these devices were wide open. Uh, contained in the configurations were VLAN IDs for their internal ISP network. Hotels, condominiums, apartments, convention center, public backbone, all this stuff. So I'll talk very briefly about disclosure because I don't do disclosure. I'm not, I don't search for bugs and vulnerabilities and things like that. But I thought when I came across this one I thought this is kind of important. So I wrote a one line, I, I looked up the uh, security contact for the ISP and I wrote more or less a one line um, email to the security contact and it was something like, I mean how do you tell, how do you tell them what you did without, you know, implicating yourself? So I said something like, um, the following IP addresses appear to allow unauthenticated access to devices on your network. 
I get an email the next day, very gracious, pretty much saying, thank you, you saved our shit. <laughs> and offering me money. I didn't ask for money. I didn't say, hey, I'm gonna hack your shit unless you pay me. I didn't say that. They offered me money, so I thought that was kind of cool. So he said, can, can, can we call you? And again, this is where your Admiral Akbar alarm is going off, right? <laughs> it's a trap, right? I mean, and so, and I'm, I'm just a, I don't do disclosure, so I'm just kind of like, I don't really know what I'm doing. So I called him. <laughs> and um, the guy was very nice. He was a younger guy. This, was a, this, is, this is not a big ISP. This is a small regional ISP. And uh, they were very gracious about what had happened. He just kind of know how I found these devices. And I didn't go into Shodan, but I did say that um, I do research on web banners, which I do. And, um, I was just, you know, doing research on specific in information and web banners, which is what I was doing, and I just came across their devices. I wasn't specifically looking for their ISP, and he, I don't think he really understood what I was telling him, but, <laughs> and he explained that, that they recently added these devices to their network, and that the guys who, you know, installed them obviously didn't disable the web interface or something like that, excuse me, and uh, asked for my address. So, again, the alarm is going off. So I talked to him on the phone and, you know, but now he wants my address because he wants to send me the check. So I gave him my address. <laughs> I will say that I haven't gotten anything in the mail. Not only not the check, but I haven't gotten like anything, you know, legal, whatever. And they did close off the problem. They did shut off their web interfaces, so their devices aren't exposed anymore. Um, but what I will tell you is that with the information I had and with the access that I had, could I, could I have routed any or all of their traffic to a third party destination and then write back to them and then just sniffed all their traffic and totally owned all their customers? Absolutely, I could have. So I don't think it's unfair to say that, I mean, really could have owned this ISP. Um, so there, I mean, yeah. A few other small examples and, and just, and then we'll, let me do on time, 37, okay. General observations. So I did some searches on Shodan. This is just for interesting data. So I searched for IS 5.0, and we know that it's Windows 2000. There's a lot of them out there, so you know, 306. This is a couple months old, but 362,000 IS 4.0. See, now we're getting older. Now we're going back into the 90s. Not still almost 10,000. Well, 3.0. You see where this is going, right? <laughs> 381 IS 2.0. 42, does anybody know, does anybody know what IS 1.0 maps to? It's like Windows NT 3.51 maybe or something like that. It's like 1995, 94-ish. <laughs> wow. If you go to these web pages, I mean, they look like they were made in 95 and never touched since. So, I mean, they may not be used. This is more of just fun for you. Just to What's that? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Let me show you one more example before I, before I go into the conclusions. This is another fun example. This is just, you've all seen uh, the Google hacking, viewing webcams and stuff like that. Every six months the news media re rediscovers the story and plays it on your local news and thinks it's something new. And it isn't. Um, what I want you to do, this is just one small side note. So, by the way, all the pan and tilt features work on this one. <laughs> These ladies were diligently working at their computers and I was like trying to get their attention and they... <laughs> they wouldn't bite, they wouldn't bite. So here's a good example of, of what I mentioned. Of if, if you don't understand the characters, I think, is this, ja I think this is Japanese. If you don't know what this means, 
you know, you can typically, the taskbar will tell you what it, it's because it's typically in English. And in, in, in this case it does. So this comes out to snapshot, so like if you wanted to take a snapshot of the whatever screen is on there right now, and then a client.html which isn't terribly useful to you. The second point about this slide is that I'm viewing this web page in Firefox. And while many people still use Internet Explorer, I don't know why you would, but you might want to, I do use something called IE View or there's several different versions of it that allow you to view, you know, view Internet Explorer in Firefox. So let's take a look at this and see that there's actually something different here. We actually have a third option. Uh, so we actually have snapshot, client and setup, .conf setup config, which was not actually viewable in Firefox. Very interesting. So this is set what happens if we go to setup config? Well, we can pretty much do anything we want. So you want to, and, and this again, another example of if you don't understand the language, mouse over and it will tell you these are all the things you can do. Security, system, network, wireless, I mean, whatever, wide open. Okay, just some general conclusions about Shodan. We've got about 10 minutes left. Shodan aggregates a significant amount of information that's not already of widely available. Could you, could you go home and do something like this? Absolutely, you could do it. But it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of resources. So someone's already done it for you. Um, it does allow for some passive vulnerability analysis. If we're looking for a certain version of software, we can say, hey, um, we can search for that and actually know with some degree of, of confidence that that IP address is running that software without ever even touching it. Um, is this going to totally take over the world? No, it's not going to. But this is, a, this is something new for penetration testers. It's something that you can do to add to your toolbox, to explore, to see what other data is out there. And I think it's going to help shape the path for future vulnerability assessments. Um, John uh, Matterly is the uh, creator of Shodan and I'll have him come up here if he's willing to answer a few questions if you have them for him. These are the guys who wrote the add-ons. People always ask about slides, so here you go. They're not there yet but they will be really soon. There's a site called scribed.com. I put all my slides from all my presentations on there. So scribed.com slash the Prez 98. Uh, there's some earlier versions of it but this, this particular slide deck will be on there uh, probably by tomorrow. So if you want the slides, there you go. We will save the last ten minutes for questions. Um, I will try to repeat them so that everybody can hear them. Um, and thank you. <laughs>